Good evening and welcome to Be Informed. My name is Carl Buhariwala and I founded Be Informed to help the community make informed decisions. Today we'll be looking at buying a home and we are joined by Mike McNamara of Strategic Buyer Agents who will be discussing buying an Australian home in 2024 with a focus on the Victorian market. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. So today's seminar will be on buying an Australian home. As I mentioned, it's catered to the Victorian market. So if you are joining us from another state in Australia, or even overseas, you may learn some tips and traps along the way, um, but just bear in mind that these are sort of tailored to the Victorian market in Australia. The information presented today by Mike is current as of this month. So if you do wish to rely on the information in the future, always check the currency of it. And I'm sure you can always reach out to Mike if you have any queries. Um, in terms of the quality of information presented today, it's general information only. And if you do require any specific information in relation to your circumstances, such as you might be wanting to buy a home, um, then please reach out to Mike and he can um, take you along that journey. So today's session will run through a rather straightforward format. Mike will present um, for around 20, 25 minutes. After that, we'll, we'll have a little um, break and then we'll go straight into Q&A. That way you can ask any questions that you have directly to Mike. To do so, just message me through the chat function and I will relay them to Mike and Mike will answer them for you. And Mike has kindly prepared a one page handout, which I will share to register participants following today's session. And the session is being recorded. So if you do have to drop in and out through along the way, don't worry, you won't miss out. You can always log in to our YouTube um, site and view the recording at your leisure. So with that in mind, I'll now hand over to Mike, who will take us through buying an Australian home in 2024. Thank you very much, Carl, and uh, hello to everyone who's looking in on this uh, seminar. Hopefully we can give you some good information about buying a property in 2024. The, uh, as Carl said, the Victorian law, the property law is actually per state in Australia. So I'll be covering the Victorian law. It's not that much different than every other state, but there are enough differences to need to know. So I'll be doing the state of um, buying property in Victoria, Melbourne and other places and uh, how it's going in the early start of the year. Now, of course, the property market goes pretty quiet from Christmas to Australia Day. So it's about a month off a bit more. It's only just waking up now uh, and listings are coming on. People like me who are in the industry are starting to get active. Uh, in fact, I just mentioned to Carl that I bid online at five o'clock today. So um, we are we are getting active. Uh, so early on, the market conditions are that things are quiet, but I did read on the property press that the number of listings that are coming on at the start of the property year are actually 50% higher than they were last year. That's very interesting and good for buyers because there'll be more choice and good on pricing because when there's a shortage of stock and plenty of buyers, a normal level of buyers, you, you get um, more competition and pushes prices, makes it difficult for you and the other way around could be what's going to be coming up for us. Uh, to cover off 2023, which we've just gone out of, and going back a bit further to give you a bit of history because it all flows through, we had the COVID boom uh, for prices and um, they were quite high and they prices started then to uh, decline to March 2023. So there was a big boom, of real over the top, declined to 2023, and last year, from about April to to November, most of the year, we just had a very slow climb in Melbourne and Victorian property prices until about November, December, when they flattened out. And that's where we think we're starting off the year, but it's hard to know. Every year has surprises. For 2024, we're thinking oh, that the, the market will be incense in two halves. The first half, probably will be flat and therefore good, good to buyers. In other words, you won't have too much pressure on prices. So that would be probably the best time to buy. But then of course, by mid-year, things will change. And we know we'll get the adjusted stage three 
tax cuts, they are going to benefit 14 million people. It's a lot. So wage, wages from then on will go up from the 1st of July. The other thing is we're expecting interest rate cuts. We don't know when, but they'll certainly be sometime in 2024. So wages rise and therefore net wages rise, therefore people can borrow more, therefore they can bid more for houses. So watch out from the middle of the year, it may be more competitive to buy. So we're saying earlier rather than later, sometimes it's the other way around. So interest rate cuts, stage three tax cuts uh, and rising wages as well could all help the market to lift soon or mid-year. Uh, so going on um, to the next page of our notes, we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk about preparing to become a buyer because you can't just say, I'm ready to buy and rush out of the market, of course, you need to do some preparation. So the things you need to consider um, when you're becoming a buyer is uh, firstly, the deposit, the saving of the deposit. Um, we'll go through those in detail. Saving deposit takes a long time now compared to what it used to. It's just a function of it. I've heard a figure of 10 years, which is incredible. But uh, every, everybody's journey is different. But you really, really need to uh, get involved to get that deposit going, normally 20%. There are government schemes around to let you lie, lie with 5%. We won't go into those but you can look into those if you wish. My advice with um, buyers is to see a broker early in the piece. Don't wait till you think you've got to deposit or you think whatever. Go and see them early because they've got a lot of tips on how you can actually get that deposit together. Um, some, it's like getting free approval for a loan. You can actually change your lifestyle and your spending. They know by looking at your bank accounts, et cetera, the things you need to trim or could trim to get to that deposit level. So get in there nice and early and I'll give you some helpful hints. So for funding, of course, we need um, the deposit. We need the loan, of course. It's going to come from a bank, perhaps through a broker. Brokers now source 70% of all property loans, or residential property loans. So they're pretty much where you would go. And other assistance, which I've got in that slide, it probably refers to even family help, which could be in the form of loans or cash or whatever. And then, of course, we move on to the banks providing the loans and the brokers often handling the loans in between you and the bank. The second dot I've got there is time, uh, preparation time. Well, there is a long lead time and you need to sort of, as we say, get, go, get going early to, to buy well. Don't just um, jump into the market. Um, and, of course, the next step after that will be inspections, which you've got to have time to do. Takes a lot of time, a lot of weekends. Some people get worn out inspecting on Saturdays and being available. You've really got to make room for it. If I have people come to me to buy them property, I've, one of the questions on my list is, are you going away on holidays? Because if they're going away on the holidays, even if I'm here, of course, they've got to be here so we can do that transaction or sign that contract or whatever it is. So being available is, is an important thing. So if you've got big absences from the market, can't be there, that's not a good time. The next dot's location. You've got to work out what your attractors are. This is all towards building your buying brief. What, what are the attractors for you? Work location, not so important now with work from home. Are the schools, are they important now or in the future? Transport's always important, shops and family. I would say that um, transport, and, uh, transport and work would be the two that come up with my clients most. But that you, that'll help you zone in as well as your purchase price on where you can buy. And of course, the types of houses go in a hierarchy. Houses are freestanding by themselves. They're the top of the tree. Then you've got townhouses, usually two level. So it can be freestanding or joined or villa units, usually joined in a row, maybe four, maybe six, and usually single level, ground level. And then you've got apartments, which can be mid-level, perhaps up to five or six storeys or high level. Think of a number. Uh, I think in Melbourne we've got one over 100 stories high, so that's that. That is high. So that's the sort of things you need to consider when you're going to become a buyer. So let's move on to buying tips, and these are very valuable. I've got buying tips and and buying things to be careful of. So this is with the buying tips. Um, I to refer there to the buying brief. Now this is something that. New buyers don't do well enough. 
the buying brief when I do them is probably 15, 16 lines. So you can, you've got a lot of detail, things you might think of, but you need to really put it down uh, and so that you've got it very clearly. And the obvious one would be locations, um, budget, uh, what lawyer you're going to use, are you going to use a broker, who would that be? Where are you going to get a building inspector? Are you going to use a buyer's agent, self-interest? Um, and perhaps your bank, you might, might start talking to your bank, but then you, you might use a broker, it's up to you. So it takes the time to do all these things, but you put it down as a hit list, which will gradually develop into your buying brief. So you've got everything there that you know what you need to do to get there. It actually takes a team to buy a property. You can't be a solo person on this. You've got to grant, gather in all this expertise, people from banks, brokers, real estate agents, whatever, bring it all in until you um, you have that list and that buying brief. When it gets to the next stage of inspecting property, you've got the ability to buy, you've got the funds, etc. You obviously do desktop search and there's plenty of ways on websites to save your searches and uh, do things carefully. For me, I use them a lot. So I'm probably very good. I would say very good at using websites. There's a lot of functionality in there that people don't use, but keep digging into it. You can see, you can save things, you can sort things, you can get alerts and so on. Then there's the physical search. So you need to to vet those down, those numbers that come up with the desktop search and go out and look at them. And perhaps a lot of properties, some people wear themselves out looking at multiple properties. So perhaps you even get to the point with me at least, uh, because I'm looking at perhaps even for two clients in the one area, I have to do a, to work out the timing between when I go, even within a half hour block, that's the usual block, I might have to look one at um, 11 o'clock and one at 10 past 11 and not all on 20 past and just get to the other one by 11.30. It's, it's got to be pretty slick and you've got to work it out and work out which one you're going to first. Uh, so inspecting the property, there's quite a few things there. When you're talking to agents as well with the do and don'ts, do ask them lots of questions, but don't give them much information because really they're just trying to build their client bidding list and um, you can give information that's against your interests. So I'll ask you, what do you think it's worth? What's your budget? How much you've got to spend? There's probably six or seven or nine ways you can say that, but you just have to hold back and uh, get information, but don't give too much. Next one on is qualifying the property. Well, that's the short listing. So you might have five or six and you need to rank them <clears throat> and decide which one you can buy. And, uh, and make it a priority and start to really drill down on that one, send it to your broker or your bank and saying, you think I could bid on this one, have I got enough money for it, et cetera, and, and get, get stuck into uh, getting ready and get certainly get ready for auction because um, you need to actually really have a lot of, a lot of the um, things in place. You need to know if you were to win an auction, you need to walk in, you need to have all your details, of course, uh, you need to have the details of your broker, and you need to know that you've got the funds to back it up and you need to have the deposit, which <clears throat> we've got new facilities where you can pay all the deposit online to, after the auction without having to go to a lot of um, preparation with your bank beforehand. Most agents have got that in place now and you can pay a very big number, 20% or whatever it is, uh, through their facility. So let's keep going with... Um, uh, Due diligence, I think that uh, traps to avoid. I think I've got traps to, that you need to avoid. Yes, well, I think I have already covered some of the real estate agent ones. Obviously, they're just doing their job. They're just trying to build a interested buyer list, and they'll actually even report that back to the to the um, to the vendor. Now, I'm also a vendor advocate. That's a person who. Actually, when people want to sell a property, they come to me, I find them the right agent, we negotiate, get them set up and the agent works on it. So from that process or that activity, <clears throat> I've learned a lot about what the agents do from the point of view of building a list of bidders or buyers and the profiles that they give to the vendors. So you'll go on one. If you're interested, you'll be on one of those lists and I'll sit down, bid campaign, whatever, with the vendors 
and say, well, we've got Joe, we've got Fred, we've got Julie, and they'll have an idea of maybe where they are in their budget and their interest in the property. So <clears throat> yes, you can say you might be interested, but you don't really don't give too much. Buying property just as an overall thing, of course, at this point, let's just say, it's a totally uneven transaction. The agent you're dealing with is selling all the time, selling property all the time, maybe for years. I just booked the one on Tuesday and he said he'd been selling for 20 years. And here you are, you front up, you're buying your first house. Uh, it's just so it's no unequal, but um, you just have to get as informed as possible. And that's what you're doing, I guess, today on the seminar so that you actually even that up a bit uh, in the transaction. Now, uh, making offers to buy is a tr very tricky one. I'll look at my notes here. Um, I would say that with before you go to that point of thinking, of what can I pay for this property? Look at the sold tab for the for the market. Now, for instance, I was involved in a property today with Preston, right in Victoria. I would put the Preston and I'll put the sold. Look at the sold tab. That's giving me real transaction numbers of recently sold properties. If I formatted that way, uh, whereas the ones on the for sale property are pretty much what the agents want or their vendors want uh, rather than what's actually happening and just happened. So that's quite informative to you before you make an offer to buy. So you, yes, so, so the, the thing is that you are, most buyers are only buying three or four properties or four properties in their lives. The agents are selling all the time. So we just have to try and even up the playing field if we can. So rule number one, when you talk to agents, is to get a lot of information about the property, but don't give a lot from, about you. So making offers, um, it's a risky thing to make offers before auction, uh, because what you're doing is you're really releasing your budget to them in a sense, even though you might keep it down, but you can trigger a sale before the auction. An online one like a participate in today, or let's put all offers in by five o'clock, all this sort of thing can happen because you've triggered it or someone else has triggered it. We never get to go to the real auction where we see real people making real numbers in on out the front of the property. So it is a dangerous thing and, and it could mean that the whole thing's gone and you didn't really have a good go at it. But bidding at auction uh, is a whole different story and it's an art form. Auctions are like street theatre and the conductor of the whole thing is the auctioneer. So they run the whole show. They'll determine the opening bid, whether it's the vendor bid or maybe someone will bid. They'll determine the price range that they put on the property in the first place. And uh, you're pretty much one of the participants in the show. But uh, you should go in with a very clear idea of what your limit is, because auctions are designed for the, for the vendor. They often to push people emotionally to pay more than they ever expected to at, on that day. But they are transparent. So I mean, I like them because I'm used to them, but for a lot of people, they're a bit scary and um, just need to have a clear head, write down, have it in front of you as to what you're bidding them in and just stick with it because otherwise you could be in trouble with funding what you might've bought. Just see if there's any other notes here. Yes, well, this usually for most people, certainly their first, property, it's the biggest uh, expenditure or biggest buy of their life at that point. So it is critical to get, get it right and follow all those things. And to get to know about auctions, go to some auctions in the area where you want to buy, even if you can't afford them, but of the same style, you're buying a house, go to house auctions, you're buying an apartment, go to those, because you'll learn from seeing the action. You'll learn from seeing the agents and you'll learn from seeing good and bad bidders at auctions. And if we get are successful, well, we've got signing up, you'll go into the property, I'll say congratulations, where's all your information? Well, you need to have that. And so you need to know, particularly you need to know who your conveyancer is or your lawyer, and you need to get all the contact details for them, and you need to be in a position to pay the deposit and uh, sign the contract as the, as the purchaser. Now the purchaser signs first and then they'll take the contract to another room in the house usually where the vendor is sitting and get them to sign. So that's the way. Once you've got two signatures on the contract, then it is a contract once the finance is paid. And uh, just back, jumping back to bidding at auction a moment, 
and I can't really go through this in much detail, but there is a, it is, is in a sense a myth, the big person with the biggest budget is the, always the buyer at auction. It's hard to explain, but there's a lot of tactics in auctions and they can be sort of pushed out of, of doing it. Uh, and it's not always the case, the person with the biggest uh, budget will win the auction. And they also, in auctions, there's no conditions. So remember that it's a clean purchase. You can't put conditions like building inspections or finance conditions. So signing up back to that, make sure you've got all your details ready. And um, most auction most auction agents have, have auction pay, a facility to pay the deposit, even though you may have a limit on your own bank account. So just going across to the buying process basics there, <clears throat> running through those as we move through these slides. Now the first one, and this is a bit of a reminder slide, I guess, is get the budgeting right, build it up, talk to people that can help you with the budgeting and, and knowing what budget you need. Usually it's 20%, but there are some other schemes. And uh, once you've got that budget, you know, make sure that you don't go buying to a point where you can't uh, actually settle the property. Uh, every lawyer would tell me, Carl probably has it too, but he's, if, you're a prop, if you're a property lawyer, they'll tell me that on Monday, people give, give them a call and saying, I didn't mean to buy a property on Saturday, but I did. Now that's all wrong. In other words, they haven't given the documents, the section 32, as we call it, the vendor statement and the contract to a lawyer or a conveyance to review before they put their hand up at auction. So all of these things need to be done in, in time. Uh, the second point was to get the buying brief right. So you know all the details, uh, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square meters of land that you'd like, suburbs, um, other facilities, close to station, whatever it is, put it all down and who the people are that's gonna help you. Then your online search and vetting, the, the, the websites out there mainly the big search is realestate.com.au.com.au has got the most of the search, but don't forget domain.com.au is also there. And it's got quite a few help things in the tabs up the top, research papers, etc., on particular prop, particular suburbs. You can click into those and see about the suburbs you're interested in. Inspecting in person, we've talked about that, um, about not giving too much away. And then you move on to shortlisting once you've got a good one put on the short list and start digging into it and perhaps running it past your your um, broker and your your lawyer or, or someone that is in the industry that can help you. And then there's targeting. It means you've got a target property, you've got to go for it, do the due diligence. That's a for me it's a six step process, but it's um, a building inspector might be part of it, a lawyer might be part of it, um, and the broker might be part of it. There's, there's more to more to it than that, but for the moment that will do. And if you're lucky enough, you'll secure the property at the auction or private purchase, and then there'll be a settlement time, typically 60 days, sometimes 90 days, when the paperwork in a sense is done between the lawyers for each party and with the banks involved till we get to settlement. The settlement is when you actually take possession of the property. So Carl, I think that's covered all things that in the basics and I can now take questions if there are any that need to follow follow through on those. Thanks, Mike. It was a very thorough presentation. I hope those listening today or those listening in the future have learned a bit about the tips and traps when buying a, a real estate property. As Mike has mentioned, it's probably one of the most expensive assets you will own. So taking the time to really invest in learning about the process and making informed decisions will help you secure the property that uh, suits you best. Mike's contact details are on screen. So as I mentioned, he works with strategic buyer agents. So if you have any specific queries or wish to engage him to get along that journey, then um, feel free to contact him directly. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. So if you have joined late, that's fine. Don't worry. You will be able to watch the entire session online on our YouTube channel. And following today's session, if you haven't been able to take some notes, don't worry again, there's a one page handout which Mike has prepared, which you can keep by your side and share with family and friends that are also looking to buy a home. So what we'll do now is we'll move to Q&A. 
And uh, we'll start first, Mike, with some questions we received ahead of the session, and then we'll jump to those that we received during the session. So, Mike, the first question is, a lot of people are talking about the um, interest rates potentially coming down in the future, as you flagged. Um, there's going to be some, you know, stage three sort of income tax cuts that are going to be rolling out, which will also mean more money in the economy. Will those two factors sort of increase, um, you know, supplies expectations or sellers expectations of a higher price and, and demand will also push prices up? So is it better to get in now or should they wait until the market sort of solidifies those two changes into the economy? Well, um, yeah, it's, it's a very um, topical question at the moment. I think that um, that's why I used the term, and it wasn't my original term, this, uh, a year of two halves, uh, because we've got to probably possibly have a steady market for a while, but those, the growth in wages, the uh, state street tax cuts, and possibly an interest rate cut will come eventually, mid-year or later. Those are all going to, I think, prod the market and give buy, put buyers at a point where they've got small strength to make bigger offers and more of them. And therefore, that's good. surely all three, I'm thinking, are going to help the market rise. Right? Prices react to more offers at a higher level. So it's not so much the vendors. The vendors just see what, go to their agent, sell the home, and the agent then sources people want to buy. Well, if those buyers have got more cash, more loan, um, as they will push higher and they'll ask for, they'll offer bigger prices and I expect the market will rise. That's my expectation. Right. And Mike, just on your current assessment of the market, yeah, I know you've mentioned that the market sort of is very quiet until about Australia Day and it's not going to slowly pick up. Do you think prices are stabilising or are they going to, you know, keep increasing at a sort of a slower rate and then probably ramp up towards the end of the year? What's your sort of your view on the prices and I know it's location specific and there's various factors, but just in general, yeah. thoughts. Yeah, well, it's good. It's a good question. But for Melbourne, Melbourne actually did flatten right out in November and December, like there was no rise, and so that's quite unusual. But every agent will tell you, and I was looking at one for Burundara, which is in Arrest the other day. He raised a lot of questions. We're interested to know how the market will open. It's actually quite. It's strange, but true because it goes so quiet. People reassess where they're at. Things change, and February comes on. People do react differently. They might have made a decision over the holidays. Right, I'm going to buy a property in 2024, or I'm going to hold off till interest rates come down. Whatever it is, but they, those all sort of things happen. We really don't know. Oh, but I expect that because it did go quiet in December or flat December and November that it will start out quiet. Particularly with the news that just came through that. There's going to be much more, many more listings uh, in February than we had in February 2023. Mm. Now, when you've got more property to, to select from, prices don't get pushed so much. Yeah. And with the phrase um, sort of short term pain, long term gain, Mike, I'm sure you're aware of that phrase, right? We've got a question here around we're looking to buy a property. We're just trying to figure out when's the right time to do it. You know, should we be motivated by what we like and just get in quick? Should we be motivated by our budget? Um, what are your sort of your thoughts of, you know, buyers always have that constant sort of, you know, you know um, conflicting thoughts in their mind or between yeah. family members. What are your thoughts on just, you know, coming to some form of sort of, you know, conclusion around whether they're going to do it or not? Yeah, uh, that's that's an evergreen, that one. Um, <laughs> and I always say to clients uh, or people who make inquiries, do it when it suits you. We can all be too reactive. Oh, it's a flat market, it's up market, it's a buyer's market, it's a down market. I think you've got it when your situation's right, like, you know, you, your, your job has moved or you've got your funds or you've got your loan or you've got pre-approval. I think when it's right for you, I think that's when you've got to move because you can already, you can react too much to prices going up, prices going down. But strangely, I mean, prices are going hiking high, which I think they will be heading up again strongly at the end of the year. I get most inquiries when prices are on fire, most people want to use a buyer's agent and they're buying, like they want to buy, but they really should be buying when prices are going down <laughs> or flat, but it's just human nature. So I say, no, forget all that. Just when you're set, you're right, then get going. Yeah. And when you've got a question here about budget being a sort of very primary concern for a lot of people, right? They will usually buy in an area which 
aligns with their budget rather than you, know, you mentioned transport location. How do you sort of work with buyers to justify the importance of valuing those other factors over and above the budget, right? Because the budget can be a controlling issue. If you're limited or constrained, then you're sort of limiting where you can buy. But, um, you know, with that same sort of, I guess, uh, phrase, short term pain, long term gain. Hmm. Um, how do you sort of reassure buyers that it's probably in their best interest to cop it now and then in the future at least they're benefiting by better location, better transport, access to schools, etc. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think well buying property is always a compromise, right? There's no perfect property. I say to people, the only perfect property is one where you buy a block and you build exactly the house you want, uh, and that's it. Um, but but every other house is a compromise. It's not quite the size you wanted, not quite the number of bedrooms, not quite the suburb, it goes on and on. And you've just got to buy what you can afford, but without regretting it right later on. Uh, the best thing to remember is that you, if you buy the location, the suburb, you know, near the station, near the school, whatever, that won't change. Primarily that won't change, but you can improve the house. You, but if you buy a house in another suburb, a great house, but it hasn't got all those things you really did want. You can't just move the house. So you can improve. You're actually buying land um, when you buy a property, plus improvements. The improvements are the house and everything on top. So you've got to remember that, particularly like if you're in the inner eastern suburbs of Melbourne, more than 50% of what you pay, those millions, that two or three million there, is in the land. If there was no house on it, it'd still be worth two million. <laughs> so um You've got to think about your buying land plus improvements, and you can improve the improvements over time. Yeah, no, that's right. And you could um, you can do that at your own pace as well, and depending on your budget too. So you don't have to you know go all out at the start. You can set them along the way. We've received a few questions that are sort of financial and tax related. So what I'll do is I'll just reiterate to the those watching today that if you want to have any. Discuss about finance and tax matters, please do consult a relevant professional in that space, like a financial advisor or a tax accountant, to ensure that you get the, the, the most current information because that sort of stuff changes mm -hmm. um, on a year by year basis and when the laws and regulations change. So I'll just park those for now and um, remind you just to sort of uh, uh, go to your accountant or your tax advisor to discuss further. Mike, we do have a question here around um, that sort of the auction process and you mentioned, you know, um, you know, bidding, there's tips and traps as well that you should be aware of and you should also go and see a few auctions and mm -hmm. just learn from them and how to do it. Um, if you do this potential uh, person who's has, uh, might, might be a nervous, nervous buyer, right? And what sort mm -hmm. of, what sort of tips can you give to that individual if they don't have any other support during that process? Like, what are your top three tips when you just enter an auction and you want to start bidding? Mike, what are your top three tips to help that nervous buyer? Well, the only way to get less nervous is to see more auctions. I think <laughs> that's, that, would be, that, is, that really is number one. Um, if they really don't, you think you're going to get stuck, then maybe, maybe get someone that's bid a few auctions or bought a property that might help them. But um, uh, like on my own, even under pressure, buyer, and I, I've been lots of auctions. Uh, it's not always the same at every auction. Every auction is different. So there's no one strategy of be the first person, um, come in second, come in strong, all that sort of thing. Everyone's bespoke in a sense. So uh, it depends what the auctioneer does. It depends what other people do. It depends where they start off in the range. It depends how slow the bids are, how fast the bids are. There's so many things to it. So um, there's no one auction bidding scenario. Or you can't just say this is the formula. So I'd say just watch auctions, perhaps get some help if you if you need, because you can't afford to be a nervous bidder. You've got to be a confident bidder. And um, yeah, it's that's and that you've got to somehow build up that confidence. I can't quite think of any shortcut really. Mm. That's all I can say. Or sort of practice, I guess, and you might want to go to a few auctions and just maybe just practice a few bids and see how you go and participate. You could. Yeah. And yeah, does it, yeah, but you've got to be a bit careful there. So. You have to be careful. Yeah, you, you want to I stop bidding. You bought it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's just anything Mac practice makes perfect, right? And it's it's always um, as you say, each option has a different dynamic and different set of people and different agents and volume and all that. So it's never really a 
Well, the other thing I should say is that, of course, selling agents know that if there's a buyer's agent there, they are on equal, they're on equal standing. We have the same real estate license that they do. So it's a bit different when we talk to them before the auction and when on inspections as well. So we did a good conversation because they can't tell us any, any rubbish. Mm. So it's hard. It's a hard one. And but, um, yeah, uh, Mike, we've got a question about speaking to the, the agent that's going to be conducting the auction or the agent's team before you bid. Does that help? You know, just letting them know that you're planning to bid and do they see that as a favorable, favorable sign or do they just consider everyone equal and. Um, yeah, I, say, I, I don't see any problem in it. I think it's uh, in New South Wales, you've got to get a, You've got to register and you get a paddle to hold up with a number on it. So when you bid, you put that put that so they know that's number three bidding. So we don't have that pre-registration thing, but so there's no requirement to bid. You can just turn up and start bidding. But I think if you've been a few times to the auction uh, to the property, they know you're interested. You've got the section 32. You've got the contract. You may have even had questions that come back from your lawyer. They pretty much know most people that are going to bid. They do get surprises, but. Um, I don't think there's any problem saying I intend to bid uh, because they'll look out for you and they'll make sure they take your bid better than missing it anyway. Mm, I think that's the key thing, right? At least they know you're there. Yep. Rather than sort of um, overlooking you and you miss out. Um, yeah. Well, it can be pretty vigorous at times. It could be being, that's being, right. being, you know. Yeah. And then you just totally miss the boat. <laughs> um, right. And Mike, with that sort of straying into any legal advice, you've got a question around the contracts. If you are going to go to an auction, and of course you take it as it is, right? You, don't, you can't add anything or request any inspections, as you mentioned, right? It's it's sort of a clean sale that way. Um, what what are some of the key things you should be looking out for if you if you had to flick through that agreement, the section thirty two of the contract of sale? Are there any key things that you look for when you're in that situation that you know might be high risk? You know, well. Um... Yes, uh, things like uh, zonings uh, and uh, overlays, they're, they're always something you've got to be careful of, if particularly an overlay will, can stop you from doing something to the property that you want to do. And you know, the, I have some client, one client at the moment wants to subdivide, well, that means we've got a that's red card there, we need to make sure we've got enough square metres and we've got the right zoning and so on. So, but a lot of that will be looked at by the lawyer or the conveyance that reviews it for you. You need to get that and really get that uh, get their review points mm. and if there's stoppers in there well you just have to walk away and go to another property that's right i think i think getting in early if you do plan to go on an auction get a copy of the contract early send it off and get that reviewed and usually most without sort of you know making a generalization most you know lawyers and conveyances might do that as a courtesy um but you always want to check to make sure what the cost is of that service and what scope of work they will do all yeah. right well yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll jump Sorry, Mike, did you have something to add? Uh, just on that, but most lawyers will do review three Section 32's contracts. Contracts are probably usually fairly plain vanilla in the sense that they're done by the Law Institute or the RLV combined. And they're also, the wording is dictated by Consumer Affairs, so they don't have much variation, but they can put in special conditions, so watch for that. Um, but uh, most lawyers will say, well, these will be our fees for doing the conveyancing, but for the starting point, you will review perhaps three section 32s without charging you, and that's assumed in the price. Yep. Yep. And Mike, just on financing, you mentioned you touched on you know the engaging mortgage brokers to assist, or you can do it yourself. There's various ways of of going through that process. Mike, if someone were to engage your services, do you also support with that sort of triaging as well, and working with the brokers and the buyers as well, just to sort of all get on the same page? Is that Yes. Something you do. Yeah. Yeah, but a, normal, um, a normal buyer's agent would have a whole team of everything that's connected with property, including you know, building inspectors and lawyers, conveyances, everything. They try, I mean, you can't pick them off a website, of course, but the ones that, if you're in the game, you don't want to be sending someone uh, a conveyance or a building inspector that's not good. So they will have a short list of good ones that, uh, the other thing is, I don't, do any um, commissions or, or anything like backwards or forwards with those people. Just pick good people that have tried and tested. So you've got to check that you make sure sometimes these so-called one-stop shops mm -hmm. where everybody's in the same room. Uh, be, be careful with that, that, you, um, that you're that you getting an independent subcontract or contractor for all these various bits and pieces. Yeah. 
And Mike, what are your thoughts on, you know, the, the very common pest and building inspections? What are your thoughts on, should people be doing that by default for every property or is it just based on gut feel or how old or new the property is? What are your thoughts on those types of due diligence activities? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of common mis mistake. I think that people think oh, I'm buying a new apartment. I don't need a build inspector. Well, possibly it may not need to, but because a, a department is just a shell within a whole big complex and they're not going to do the whole complex. Um, but that's, that's putting those aside. Build inspectors tell me that, that a brand new townhouse or something that they'll go and inspect, they'll still get lots of faults. And of course, we've had lots of stories in the press about building faults. But yes, I. I, I recommend to all my clients to get a building inspection. Uh, if the if we were knocking down the house or, or, so, or something like that, well, obviously we wouldn't. But I do recommend it. It's their discretion, and um, they might have to throw a few hundred dollars, three, four, five hundred dollars at it. But if you do it carefully, you might only do one or two. It's a problem that all the purchasers, particularly for auctions, need to get that done. It's not a good system. In Queensland, quite often the vendors do the building inspection and hand that to the buyers, which is much better. Mm. But um, even if you do waste a couple of building inspection costs, then it's worthwhile. Now, if it's a for sale prop property, you can say, I'll buy this property subject to the building inspection. There's a clause in there you can tick in the contract. And then for you, if you're the buyer, then you'll incur the building inspection cost. But if you're going to an auction, you need to get it done beforehand because there's no conditions, you know, in option. No conditions, yes, right. And what are your thoughts, Mike, just to sort of extend that question, the person hasn't asked this specifically, but <clears throat> when you do get a buyer that's got a building inspection, they've got the report, I uh, assume it's a private sale, of course. Um, do vendors really cooperate when issues are raised with the vendor? It's really at the vendor's discretion, isn't it, unless it's something from a compliance perspective. But yes. have you uh, seen much well, for that? Well, there's a couple of ways. One, I've bought property where I think it was a few years ago now. Was, I think the uh, the inspector, we liked the property. We wanted to buy that property in that location. But he came up with quite a few fixes. They weren't, they were, what I would call neglected maintenance, and they could be fixed. And I said, okay, come up with a figure on it. And he added all up. He came up with my estimates, $8,000. Now, in the context of what we were buying, that was quite big. So we reduced the price. We reduced our offer by $8,000. <laughs> if you can get away with it, that's good. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, that's one way. But the building inspectors um, are really to find that there's any serious things. And in fact, you can only void the contract or withdraw the contract if it's a structural issue. So if you really read the words of the building inspection clause in the normal contract, you can get out of the contract if there's a structural issue. So that's the whole building. There's something wrong with the building, the foundations, or the roof, whatever, not just cracks, cracked tiles or a squeaky door. So little things shouldn't put you off. If that's what comes out of the report, keep going. They can be fixed. But structural things, you walk away. I had one in Ferntree Gully and the inspector went in the roof and underneath he came back and he said, Mike, if that, that couldn't be built today, it just doesn't have enough support, whatever. I said, guess what? We're out of there. We're not buying it. <laughs> so it's useful sometimes. Definitely. Um, and it sort of just adds another, I guess, set of eyes over the property and someone objective and someone a bit experienced in looking at those issues. Yeah. Can I just say one more, Carl? That is, I think it was last year, the year before in North Bendigo. The inspector did everything. Things weren't too bad, but he did say the electricity box is falling apart the electric on the outside. And it, uh, there should be pictures, and it was a disaster. We negotiated to have that fixed before we, we, till we, till we actually signed the purchase deal, and it was fixed. Oh, there you go. Because yeah. it was a dangerous thing. It was dangerous. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's, a, you know, it's more of a safety thing, isn't it, really, from the energy perspective? Um, and Mike, I've got a final question here. Um, you know, property prices are high, as we all know, and they're going to keep going up or, you know, at a slow or fast pace, regardless. A lot of people are now looking into, um, you know, the whole purchasing a property, renting some rooms out or keeping a few rooms for themselves, you know, doing that sort of rent vesting type thing that we've heard in the news. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that to help people buy support with the mortgage repayments? Do you see that as a useful strategy? Do you see that commonly among your clients or is it a bit... 
not commonly, but I know that people do buy a property that's you know bigger than they need, and they can then let, let the room and help them get through that the first year or two of of uh, uh, actually doing the repayments and good on them if they can manage that, and uh, it's that's okay. Uh, but just on yields, which said yields, you're talking about investing. That's the rentals compared to the purchase price, and as a percentage on an annual basis. I just find a book for him, Bendigo last uh, no, Ballarat last year. Just told me he's now getting five hundred dollars a week. We paid seven fifty thousand for the property. It's great. California bungalow, if you know your styles, and um, that's three point six percent. Now that is high, and that's partly why we went to Bendigo for someone who lives in Melbourne, because in Melbourne they probably get two point six. You know, and, and of course they wouldn't have much choice at that price. So it depends where you buy, what your yield's going to be, and uh, you need to have a strong place that's got a strong rental demand. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, that's been a great sort of session with um, a lot of informative information there. Mike's details are on screen again, so if you do have any queries or wish to engage with services, please do contact him directly. And um, that now brings us to the end of today's session. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, so if you have joined late or had to leave early or, or whatever, don't worry, it's all, it's all recorded and will be on our YouTube channel shortly. Michael's also prepared a one-page handout, so you'll get that to those that have registered. Um, you'll receive a document which you can keep for yourself and share with family and friends. So thank you again for attending a Be Informed session. Please do follow us and, um, and, and share uh, um, the work that we do with your family and friends on our social media pages. We do rely on word of mouth, um, so we do uh, thank you for advocating, being informed to others. And thank you, Mike, uh, for presenting a very informative session and hope those that have attended today can take away thanks, something. Thanks, Carl. And can take away something, have learned something, and um, maybe buy a property very soon. <laughs> Good on you. Okay, thanks, Carl. Thanks for thanks to be informed. And uh, hope the people who attended the seminar get some uh, good benefit out of it. Thank you. All right, so bye for now. Thank you all. Thank you.